Y'all ever have a moment where you just endlessly dwell on a topic and try to comprehend everything about it? What are Cybermats? We see these little terrors pop up from time to time throughout the course of the Doctor Who franchise, as they are occasionally deployed as a part of the wider schemes of their heartless masters, the Cybermen. But what is their purpose? How do they fit in with the Cybermen on a conceptual level? Do they even fit? And why are their appearances so intermittent? I want to explore all this and more as we do a deep dive on these, for want of a better term, Pets of the Cybermen. So to get the ball rolling, let's discuss how the idea for the Cybermats actually came about. So, among Doctor Who's most iconic and formidable antagonist species are the Cybermen, a race who I don't think can be better summed up than by the name they have. They were the collaborative creation of Jerry Davis, the show's story editor in 1966, and a certain Doctor Kit Peddler, hired to be an unofficial scientific advisor for the show by producer Innes Lloyd. Together, Peddler and Davis specialised in narratively exploring then cutting edge scientific advancements and their potential impact on humanity, and the subject of organ and limb replacements led them to ponder the hypothetical extreme of a people who substitute so much of themselves for artificial material that they simply cease to be, well, them. A very profound example of the anxieties surrounding transhumanism in the mid-1960s. Either way, after having established and developed their cyborg race, in the season 4 serials The Tenth Planet and The Moon Base, Peddler and Davis decided to shake things up for their third Cyberman outing that would kick off season 5. One of their additions here was to provide the Cybermen with a form of complementary animal-like creature which would tap into that common creepy crawly phobia of scuttling invasive insects, but with a technological twist seemingly inspired by Peddler's own enthusiasm for small artificial intelligent mechanisms, they would specialise in homing in on human brain activity. An interesting idea. Obviously, calling them the Cybermen's pets is quite facetious and a little misleading of me since, well, it implies affection, which Cybermen obviously don't feel. But on a purely tactical level, it does make sense for the Cybermen to deploy such creatures if, say, they require an advanced guard in their invasive operations, or desire to perform reconnaissance while avoiding detection, or if they need a method of circumventing blockades via otherwise impossible crevices. So yeah, conceptually, I buy their inclusion. So with the backstory explored, how about we take a look at the implementation? Cybermats make their debut in the 1967 serial The Tomb of the Cybermen, which, as I stated earlier, was the opening story of Doctor Who's fifth season and the third ever Cyberman adventure on television. Let's set the stage. On the planet Telos, an archaeological expedition is exploring, well, check the title, and the Doctor and friends turn up and tag along because Cybermen, even apparently extinct ones, mean trouble. While exploring the structure, Jamie finds a lone, seemingly dormant Cybermat in the weapons testing room, and Victoria later thinks it's a fossil and takes a liking to it. And curiously, despite it being the first time we as the audience have seen such a thing, the Doctor seems to recognise it and identifies it from notes in his 500 year diary, so has he encountered them before in some prior unseen outing? Anyway, this lone Cybermat reactivates in tandem with its masters later on in the story and attacks Kafton. But Victoria bravely chucks it away with her bare hand and guns it the hell down, Jesus Christ. And after the rest of the expedition bar Toberman escape from the tombs below and seal the entrance hatch, the Cybermen decide to whip out the old mats and test them on Toberman's brainwaves, before sending them up to the surface via vents to attack the Doctor and the rest of the group while they sleep. There's a common misconception that the threat of the Cybermats isn't made clear here, when we literally have a close-up shot of their sharp gnashing teeth. 
A fact supported by the lone Cybermat earlier having chewed its way out of Victoria's bag, those things have chompers. The Doctor halts the approach of the little critters with an electrical field generated by a power cable and a bad pun. Complete metal breakdown. Ooh. And that's about it for this story as far as the Cybermats are concerned, save for the very end where one escapes the tomb amid some commotion and watches the Doctor and friends leave, ominously implying that this ain't truly the end, not by a long shot. So what to make of their execution here, and what does their presence contribute? Well, it's an interesting situation, and one that actually relates to the wider overall narrative direction. As mentioned previously, Hedler and Davis decide to pursue a different story structure for their metal lads this time around. Rather than have the Cybermen attack and infiltrate human territory as they did in both of their previous outings, here the writing duo instead opted to reverse the roles in a sense and bring the adventure right to the Cybermen's doorstep, and when it comes to the actual premise of the tale, Petler and Davis drew inspiration from a particular theme rooted in both real-world culture and popular entertainment. The Curse of the Pharaohs. That's right, the Tomb of the Cybermen is highly influenced by Egyptology and the cultural anxieties that surround it. According to Michael Seeley's biography about Kit Pedler, he and Jerry Davis used the classic 1932 horror film the Mummy and its 1959 remake as the springboard to launch the tale from. Such films and other fiction concerning reanimated mummies and the like draw a lot of inspiration from exotic superstition concerning the final resting places of ancient Egyptians in the real world, where unfortunate incidents that occurred during archaeological expeditions to such places were attributed to ancient curses that were inflicted on those who dared to disturb the dead. Such such superstition exploded in popularity in the wake of Howard Carter's excavation of Tutankhamun's tomb in 1922, and naturally our cultural imagination ran wild, hence how films like The Mummy got inspired, and hence how Pedler and Davis got further inspired from that when writing The Tomb of the Cybermen. It's always fascinating to me when humanity is just… a domino effect. And when I lay it all out there, this inspiration is pretty obvious. This story has its own archaeological dig pursuing the truth behind the apparent extinction of a civilization. They find a deserted and imposing building decorated with the effigies of those entombed. Within this building are complex logical puzzles and devious traps and strange symbols. And the ultimate message is about how some ancient secrets are just better left alone. Last time, they were frozen for five centuries. This time it must be forever. The gang's all here. Hell, it's even been noted by those in the know that the layout of the Tomb of the Cybermen actually closely resembles the layout of Tutankhamun's tomb. The only major difference is being that Tut's tomb is all on the same level and doesn't have any traps. And that's before you even acknowledge the thematic parallels. How Egyptian mummies had their organs removed and were awaiting their resurrection, so too are the Cybermen here. And there's even a sarcophagus-like structure that quite literally aids in that process for the Cybermen. And when it comes to <clears throat> the vibe check, so to speak, there's an icy atmosphere laced throughout the tale that combines the awestruck wonder of archaeological discovery with the unwelcoming, almost cursed nature of the structure being investigated. Hell, Viner himself points this out. There's this damn building. It's alive. It's watching us. It'll get us all. We've got to leave. What? Viner, more like Viber. No, ignore me. Anyway, with all that being said, it's pretty clear how Cybermats fit in here. Their conceptual inspiration was off-putting bug life, Davis himself cited Silverfish specifically, but in terms of the role they play in this analogy, they are akin to scarabs, an insect that the ancient Egyptians revered as symbols of resurrection, to the point that many mummies in the real world are found adorned with scarab amulets. This is reflected in the story itself with the first lone Cybermat, which both Jamie and Victoria mistake for a harmless inanimate archaeological object. Hell, when Victoria bags the thing as a keepsake, there's an ominous edge to it, like the act of her taking the object is going to bring misfortune on the group. 
And then of course it later reawakens at the same time as its masters, tying into that aforementioned theme of scarabs as symbols of resurrection. It's also interesting how the Cybermen themselves interact with the group of mats that they subsequently send up to the surface. Not only is this really the only time we ever see the Cybermen extensively interact with these creatures, but it's also noteworthy how attentive and gentle they are with them delicately placing them on the ground themselves and then on the runway, instead of just immediately commanding them on where to go? Obviously in universe it's to make sure they're functioning at maximum capacity, but thematically with the parallel to how scarabs were sacred to the pharaohs, it is an interesting detail to note that does fit with the wider Egyptology pastiche. Of course, real scarabs aren't actually dangerous, they're just dung beetles, but I think we as humans tend to have that averse lizard brain response to most forms of creepy crawlies anyways, and as I mentioned earlier, that is what the Cybermats tap into. And in execution, yeah, the Cybermats do indeed display a patchwork of general bug-like attributes and tendencies. Aesthetically, they have bulging fly-like eyes and antennae, an underbelly of millipede legs, and even parasitical behaviours like leaping onto people, scuttling along, and searching for bare skin like a mosquito. You might ask why the Cybermen would design creatures with such aspects, but honestly, I can see them finding these qualities to be be quite efficient as survival mechanisms, especially when you consider just how prevalent and resilient a lot of insect species really are. Narratively, I do like the escalation too, how there's only one small model at first, and then later there's a swarm of a more imposing looking variant, and that group attack makes for a very impactful tonal shift back into the action after the moving down to earth talk between the Doctor and Victoria. Their presence here does actually feel necessary too, as the Cybermen themselves cannot physically access the upper levels at this point and, as I said earlier, it does make sense for them to conceive of contingencies for situations like this. That said, while I did go to bat for their threat level earlier, I will say that maybe the danger of their sharp teeth could have been conveyed more strongly. Perhaps one of the characters could have actually been bitten to really sell it. Then again, maybe that would have been too gruesome, I don't know. That frothing Cyberman and at the end already ruffled a few feathers by itself after all. But in short, yeah, the Cybermats fit into the overall thematic parallel very well, and in themselves make an effective addition to Cyberman mythology, and I can see them becoming a staple of their strategies later down the line. So what happened? Cybermats have had a strange history. So the Tomb of the Cybermen is one of the most popular Doctor Who stories of all time, and quite aptly its iconography and ideas have gone on to influence many following Cyberman adventures. The Cybermats are certainly not exempt from this, they've shown up multiple times not just in the TV show, but also in expanded media. Come on little fella, shoo. You brought a Cybermat into my TARDIS! However, their subsequent television appearances are very infrequent, and they also go curiously underutilised even when they do feature. Going solely by their TV appearances, Cybermats have only appeared three additional times, and those instances were pretty sporadic. The Wheel in Space in 1968, which funnily enough bookends the same season as Tomb of the Cybermen, 1975's Revenge of the Cybermen, and Closing Time in 2011. 11. And while all of these appearances have their own interesting spins on the Cybermats as a concept, they also fall short of fully capitalising on them. Structurally, all three of these adventures implement the Cybermats as the first phase of the Cybermen's plan, so to speak. For the Wheel in Space, they're an advanced guard of saboteurs for an upcoming invasion, being stealthily sent over to the titular wheel to consume the banalium fuel for the defence laser. As part of a convoluted scheme to get the humans to go looking for a backup supply elsewhere and be lured out to the Cybermen's hideout. In Revenge of the Cybermen, they are an object of subterfuge and murder, being controlled by a triple agent called Kelman to poison and kill off everyone on Nerva Beacon to make way for the arrival of its masters. And in closing time, it's acting as a leech, scouting about a suburban shop and absorbing electrical power from the area 
Carrier to send back to its parent cybership buried underground. In concept, all of these are perfectly functional roles for them to have, but taking a closer look, it's obvious that there are some missed opportunities here. So, the wheel in space. God, the whole Cyberman plot is just a mess generally speaking, and something I've already thoroughly explored in another video, but we're gonna do it again here for the Cybermats' benefit. Alright, so the Cybermats have the plot point of consuming the Benalium, that's all hunky-dory. And they also get a fairly effective scene where they kill one of the Wheel's crew, or rather, as my partner dubbed it, a scene where a man dances to death against the Cybermats. They also retain their bug-like attributes from their debut story, with the snazzy addition of a ranged attack, that's neat stuff. But when the Cybermen do manage to lure the humans to their hideout and subsequently smuggle themselves on board the wheel, the Cybermats pretty much lose all plot relevance. And that's honestly a bit mystifying, because one of the Cybermen's strategies once aboard is to mind control members of the crew to sabotage parts of the wheel's functionality. But why couldn't that have been a job for the Cybermats? Especially since another part of the Cybermen's plan already involves screwing around with the wheels. Sectional air supply. So just have the mats be an extension of that and stealthily send them through the vents to do some sabotage. That would have been smart usage of them. The mind control aspect of the Cybermen's plan is extremely superfluous since they already have the means to achieve those specific goals. And that actually includes heading over to the wheel in the first place. Why bother luring the humans over to their hideout and mind controlling them to smuggle them across, when they could have just sent themselves over in their own floating eggs like they did with the Cybermats at the start. There's no explanation as to why they can't have done that. The Cybermen's whole plan in this narrative is them taking three lefts to take a right, and it's to the point where the Cybermats feel like an afterthought with no further narrative purpose by the time the Doctor and Jamie encounter them in the wheel's loading bay and destroy them. It's a shame. Granted, this was the first Cyberman story with no direct involvement from their creators Pedler or Davis in the actual scripting process. Pedler merely provided the outline and David Whittaker was commissioned to fully flesh it out. And while Whittaker is one of my favourite writers for Doctor Who due to his character writing, I will admit sometimes he does go a little off the rails when it comes to plot. So maybe to effectively realise the Cybermats, they need a hand from one of the writers who initially created them. Well, we're in luck, because Revenge of the Cybermen is a Jerry Davis script. Heavily botched by Robert Holmes in the editing process, but still, Jerry's name is on it, so how about that? And that's how we ended up with no one's favourite Cyberman story. The serial which first stated that the cyber race, both mats and men, have a crippling weakness to gold of all substances. So, yeah, we're already not off to a great start. Okay, credit where it's due. This outing presents us with a legitimately interesting shakeup of the Cybermat design and gimmicks. Shrugging off the bug-like attributes to be more serpentine, to the point where their method of attack is to infect victims with venom via a bite. I can roll with that, and it makes for an effective moment when it catches Sarah off guard and attacks her. Well, carry blight and scorn notwithstanding. Additionally, when Kelman is found out by the Doctor and co, we actually get an interesting new twist on the Cybermat's implementation. The Doctor, having found Kelman's control device for the mat, turns the tables on him and threatens him with it as an interrogation method. This concept comes into play again much later in the adventure when the Cybermen themselves have taken control of Nerva Beacon. The Doctor plans to weaponize the Cybermat against them by filling its venom compartment with gold dust and controlling it to attack its former masters. The dumb as hell weakness to gold thing aside, weaponizing a creation of the Cybermen against them is a plot point ripe for potential. And yet it goes virtually nowhere because the Doctor and Sarah are pretty much immediately subdued with a cyber massage after a mere two kills that don't really gain them any advantage. Like, come on, you could have done so much more with that.
Speaking of underutilization, as effective as it is, the plot point of it having infected Sarah doesn't really last that long either, being resolved with a transmat beam fairly quickly after the attack. Also, I don't know if this is just me, but I think it's fair to say that this cybermat seems to have less autonomy than its predecessors. Not that it doesn't have a mind of its own, or that the mats in previous stories were fully independent of course, but I don't know, this one feels like the most directly remote controlled of any Cybermat so far, and I'm not sure how to feel about that. Anyway, that's the last time the Cybermats appeared in Classic Who, and they wouldn't return to the television continuity again until the revived series episode, Closing Time. And again, not off to a great start, because it's closing time. It'd be beating a dead horse to mention how the Cybermen and their whole subplot were done dirty here. Writer Gareth Roberts, claimed it was his idea to do a Cyberman story, and aimed to restore them to their ominous 1960s roots of mostly lurking in the shadows. Which I assume is why the Cybermat was brought back for this episode, as it acts as the focal point of the threat so as to keep its masters out of the spotlight for as long as possible. But taking a look at the execution of its inclusion, it exists. Given the setting of the department store with all its playthings, the Cybermat seems designed to be more toy-like to reflect that, I guess? And Auntie Mabel labels it the Silver Rat, framing it as something of a rodent loose in the shop. It also later reveals a set of sharp teeth which do in fact harken back to the original design. As for its role in the plot, the Doctor tracks it down as the source of local energy drainage and catches it. It plays possum for a little bit, and then wakes up and attacks Craig for what I think is meant to be the big action scene of the episode, but alas, before before it can succeed, it is swiftly defeated by an increasingly overpowered Sonic app? God, this episode is stupid. And then, once again, we get the plot point of the Doctor repurposing the Cybermat to work against its masters, which also, once again, doesn't go anywhere. And that's especially annoying here, because this is also the episode that infamously showcases that intense emotion can overcome cyber conversion. You could have easily had it so the Cybermat secretly sabotaged the conversion machinery and then triggered the ship to self-destruct. It would have kept the same narrative outcome while also fulfilling the plot point of repurposing the mat and not making the Cybermen look anywhere near as bad. Sure, it robs Craig of agency, but ugh, who cares? It probably would have been more effective if the Doctor kept the sabotage on the down low, so Craig comes out of this life or death situation more wary of the Doctor's methods, which could in turn support the overall series arc of the Doctor questioning his own methods. Food for thought. Yeah, I'm sensing a pattern here. All of of these following stories are struggling with utilizing the Cybermats effectively. And that's not all, because there are other serials which they were planned to be in, or could have been in, but for whatever reason their inclusion was opted out of. Allegedly, they were planned to appear in the invasion at an early point in production, but this didn't pan out for whatever reason, and honestly I don't see how they would have fit. They were also suggested to appear in Silver Nemesis in the sequence where the policemen get gassed, but Andrew Cartmel vetoed that. Though the plan design does appear later in more than 30 years in the TARDIS. And then you get these other stories that don't feature the Cybermats exactly, but instead introduce their own variant of cyber creature that narratively fulfills the same function, and still gets underutilized. The most prominent example of this are the Cyber Mites from Nightmare in Silver, which can automatically convert pretty much any living organism into joining the Siberiad. The narrative application of such overpowered technology pretty much amounts to giving the Eleventh Doctor some facial bling that makes him even more annoying than usual somehow. Again, credit to my partner for that one. And they're a weird idea anyways, because they seem to be an attempt to evolve the concept of the Cybermite into a more insectoid direction. How can I improve Cybermats? I thought Cybermites. Even though the Cybermats were already an insect allegory to begin with, so this strikes me as a misunderstanding of the original concept. Nothing new for this story. Other episodes like The Next Doctor and Ascension of the Cybermen similarly introduce their own flashy new Cyberpets of the day, the Cybershades and the Cyberdrones respectively, that also suffer from severe underutilization 
animation, their inclusion amounting to one action set piece, and that's about it. What's going on here? Why are these inclusions just not amounting to much? I don't think it's a case of the Cybermen simply not needing a subservient cybernetic creature, because all of these stories have pinpointed effective niches for them to occupy that their masters could not. This is also why I don't think this is a case of them only working in the context of their debut. The Scarab allegory was a great basis to build them off of, but I don't think it's mandatory for their inclusion, and those subsequent stories showcase interesting twists on their animalistic concept that do work. And yet, there is still this curious lacking that plagues them whenever they return. And I think I know what it is. And again, it all links back to narrative structure. Because despite how in-depth I went about them in their debut appearance, when I actually lay out everything the Cybermats do in Tomb of the Cybermen, on paper it's also not really all that much but it doesn't feel like it, or at least not to the same degree. And the reason for that is because of the type of story that Tomb of the Cybermen is. It's a slow burn explorative piece in the sleeping villain's lair. The first half of the serial is primarily dedicated to investigation, establishing the serial's atmosphere and sowing in the seeds of apprehension about what the characters will find. And the overall premise is about assuring that the threat which the Cybermen represent remains dormant. All this narratively justifies the limited screen presence and actions of not only the Cybermats, but the Cybermen too. Which is why I've never really bought the criticism that they don't do much here, because bruh, that's quite literally the point. And the thing is, when they are active, the serial is actually really quite interested in them. But such narrative framing does not exist in the Cybermats' subsequent appearances. There's no reason for them to just completely drop all narrative relevance once the Cybermen arrive on the wheel, they just do. And the same goes for the plot point of the Doctor reprogramming them in their other two appearances. It just fizzles out. Despite all three of these installments bringing interesting new elements to the table for the Cybermats, they've ultimately not really succeeded in expanding their role in a narrative context outside of their debut, and their returns are really with missed opportunities. In short, if Cybermats ever return, I think more should certainly be done with them. <sighs> I really did just write a whole video about bloody Cybermats, didn't I? I have issues. And a touch of the tism. And a sore throat. I need a drink. <laughs> Oh my god! No! Get off it! Get off it! So, what you're saying is you want me to do more? Is eight years on the channel not enough? Oh. Get it? Because it's a cyber mat. Matt? former member of the channel, you get it. I don't need to impress you. Oh. <laughs>